fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So why did I decide to, to talk about this topic? There's thousands of other things I could talk about. Number one is, you know somebody who has this, guaranteed. Number two, this person that you know probably doesn't know that he or she has it. And lastly, if you inform yourself of FASD, you could potentially help this person. So FASD occurs when alcohol and the fetus meet, and this is definitely not a good combination. So when a woman, a pregnant woman, drinks alcohol, the alcohol crosses the placenta. And this can affect the fetus in a number of ways including brain damage. It can also cause growth restrictions, facial abnormalities, and also an issue with lifelong cognitive and also behavioral impairments. And that's kind of what I'll be discussing in this video. So even small amounts of alcohol at any stage of pregnancy, this can interfere with, with fetal development, making FASD entirely preventable. To put this into perspective, there are two and a half times more people who have FASD in the United States than who have autism. And studies have put this number at about 4%. 4% of the population has FASD. Personally, I think this number is probably a little bit higher, probably closer to 6 And the kicker is that 60% of people with FASD look completely normal. And that's what I'm going to be concentrating on today is those who look normal and who escape diagnosis and some of the problems that they face later on in adolescence and especially in adulthood as FASD symptoms can worsen as we get along in life. All right, let me do just some quick house cleaning. FASD, it's a spectrum. At the extreme end of that spectrum is what's called FAS or fetal alcohol syndrome. And this is not what I'm going to be talking about today. People with FAS at the extreme end of the spectrum, they've got facial abnormalities. And making a diagnosis on these infants is not as hard as making a diagnosis, obviously, on an infant who looks completely normal. So let's go back to the 1970s. And this is when they very first started to connect the dots between alcohol consumption during pregnancy and abnormalities with the infant. And the very first warning from the U.S. Surgeon General came out in 1977. So let's do a hypothetical here. And let's say we've got a female who's pregnant back in 1974. So before this warning came out. And let's assume that she was drinking alcohol on a regular basis and even sometimes binge drinking. So this baby right now would be about a 50-year-old adult. And if there were no hallmark facial characteristics to alert the doctor uh, when he was born that something might be wrong, chances are that this person has FASD that's undiagnosed. And chances are he's had a very difficult life, mainly with cognitive problems and behavioral issues. So let's take a snapshot, take a look at this guy's life and what it probably looks like. Number one, he's got learning difficulties, probably difficulties with either reading, writing, arithmetic, reading or writing, writing and arithmetic, or some combination thereof. He's got problems learning. And if you've got problems learning, this is going to lead to difficulties with obtaining a good education and also pursuing employment opportunities, good employment opportunities. As an analogy, it's like if you're a second grader and your teacher is giving you college level assignments, no, no matter how hard you try, no matter how much effort you put into it, it's going to be difficult to complete this task. And this is what makes it extremely tough for adults with FASD to pursue education and employment opportunities. And that's why they struggle with financial stability. And this can potentially lead to things like poverty and homelessness. And in fact, if you look at some of the studies, 23% of homeless individuals in North America may have FASD. Another thing they can have is issues with memory. So struggling to hold on to new information, remembering past events, or just keeping track of things 
Also, attention can be a problem. So have you ever felt like your thoughts are constantly darting around and you're having a hard time staying focused, staying on task? This is a daily battle for most people who have FASD. Another thing you can see is a struggle with abstract concepts and ideas like solving problems, critical thinking, or even understanding metaphors. And it's important to recognize the cognitive difficulties that these people have, it can vary widely. So no two FASD sufferers manifest the exact same signs and symptoms. So some may have, let's say, issues more so with reading and writing, but maybe not so much with math. Or they may have problems with attention and memory, but maybe not so much with abstract thinking. All righty, so let's switch gears and talk about the emotional and behavioral experience that most people with FASD do experience. And this is what I call the roller coaster of FASD. And these are mood swings. So they can go from being completely chill one minute to full on frustration and anger in the blink of an eye. And as you can imagine, they are going to be more prone to having impulsive outbursts. For example, making a hasty decision without considering the consequences, such as engaging in risky behavior, whether it be risky sexual behavior or stealing, or it can even be making a hastily made poor financial decision. And this is the last thing that they need because they're probably already having some financial instability. In addition, they're also going to have a difficult time socializing. So for them, it can be like showing up at a party where everybody's speaking a different language. You can imagine how difficult that would be. And to make matters worse, a lot of people who have FASD, they have problems picking up on social cues. So this can be extremely awkward. The learning difficulties, problems with employment, financial instability, the behavioral issues, problems socializing, this is a huge burden to carry. And that's why substance abuse is much more common in people who have FASD. And substance abuse, that's like pouring gasoline on a fire. That's a, a quick way um, to experience a downward spiral. Now I want to touch on an aspect of FASD that has always fascinated me. And that is the sensory problems that some of these people can experience. This actually does have a fancy name. It's called Sensory Processing Disorder, SPD. And what's really interesting is that those affected with FASD can have either overstimulation of their senses, where they're cranked up to an 11, or understimulation, where they're dialed down all the way to a 1 or a 2. Take sound, for example. Ever tried to have a conversation with someone in a loud room, but it's like everybody's talking at once? Well, for FASD sufferers, it can be like trying to pick out a single voice, not just in a crowded room, but in a crowded stadium. And individuals might be overwhelmed by things like loud noises, sudden sounds, busy or loud environments. And on the flip side, they may not respond to sounds and they may need more auditory input. And what about the visual stuff? Well, they can have sensitivity to bright lights. They can also have difficulty tracking objects visually or processing visual information quickly. Now let's talk about touch. Some FASD sufferers are over-responsive, and this is common, and this can cause discomfort and distress from things like light touches, certain textures, or even tags on your clothing. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, they may have under-responsiveness to touch. So, in these instances, these individuals seek out intense tactile experiences, such as touching everything, or they may crave strong movements like spinning, jumping, rocking. They may even find some relief from things like fidgeting or chewing on objects. Also, taste and smell. Sometimes they'll have a strong reaction to a certain taste. And this often leads to picky eating. And things get really dicey when you have several senses that are being amped up all at once. Another difficulty they have is with sensory integration. So this can actually lead to things like poor coordination, clumsiness, or completing tasks that require multiple sensory inputs. And as you can expect, this can be overwhelming. 
and people with FASD are more prone to anxiety and also irritability. So for caregivers, for family members, and even for therapists, it's crucial to understand these sensory issues that some of these people suffer from and to provide support and accommodation to them. So creating sensory-friendly environments, providing targeted therapies, these things can significantly improve not only their daily functioning, but also their quality of life. All right, so what I've been talking about mainly are those adults that have escaped the formal diagnosis of FASD because they look normal. So I just want to touch briefly on what physical characteristics can be seen in people who have FASD. So these people are obviously much more likely to get diagnosed with FASD earlier in life since they have some type of visual abnormality. Some things you can see, and these would include facial abnormalities, so smaller eye openings, a thin upper lip, and also a smooth ridge between the nose and the upper lip. You can also see growth deficiencies, such as a small head size. You can see low birth weight and also short stature. This is because FASD can affect individuals in many different ways, and the symptoms and severity of this disorder, it can vary widely. And it is precisely the lack of physical abnormalities that can make it challenging for physicians, family, and also friends to understand the extent of their difficulties, the extent of what they're facing, and in turn, the support that they need. It's also important to note that the symptoms of FASD, these can become more pronounced as we age, and they can become more noticeable over time. And you can only imagine how difficult it can be to diagnose these individuals. They don't start having problems until maybe later in life, and they look completely normal. So how are adults diagnosed with FASD? Well, this usually involves a evaluation, a comprehensive evaluation by a team of healthcare professionals. And these include a primary care doctor, a psychologist, and usually a neurologist. And these are the steps that are typically involved in the diagnostic process. Number one is medical history. This is invaluable. You have to have a medical history to diagnose somebody with FASD. They have to have had a mother who consumed alcohol while they were carrying their child. Without this, there is no diagnosis of FASD, plain and simple. Now, sometimes it plays out that the mother actually comes in and gives her account, if she can, or as accurately as possible, how much she drank and when in the pregnancy she drank. This helps immensely. And obviously you need a very good, very thorough physical exam. The reason for this, so you can rule out other potential diagnoses which could be causing his or her symptoms. Next, you need neuropsychological testing. So a psychologist or a neurologist will perform a series of tests to assess the individual's cognitive, behavioral, and also emotional functioning. Now, these tests may include measures of memory, attention, problem solving, and also executive functioning. Also used are interviews and questionnaires. So you have a medical professional who conducts interviews not only with the individual, but also with the family member if possible. And this is so they can gather more information about their history and also their symptoms. Next, we have imaging studies. So in some cases, a healthcare professional may request imaging studies such as MRIs or CAT scans to rule out other neurological conditions that could be contributing to the individual symptoms. So it's important to note that the diagnostic process for FASD can be complex and it may involve multiple visits and also multiple assessments. However, with the proper resources, and the proper support, many of these people with FASD, they are able to receive a definitive diagnosis and therefore accessing the resources and support that they need to manage their condition effectively and to go on and lead fulfilling and successful lives. All right, so now let's say you have the diagnosis of FASD. So what assistance and what support might you benefit from? Number one, there are therapeutic interventions. So many adults with FASD benefit from counseling, from cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, 
or other forms of psychotherapy. So these interventions can help individuals manage their symptoms and also to improve their quality of life. Also, you have medication management. So some of these adults with FASD, they might benefit from certain medications to manage certain specific symptoms, such as impulsiveness, anxiety, or depression. So a healthcare professional will determine if medication is appropriate and also determine the best treatment plan. There are also vocational and educational support programs. So many adults with FASD, they do benefit from vocational and educational support, such as vocational rehabilitation programs and also accommodations in the classroom. So these resources can help individuals pursue education and also employment opportunities that suit their strengths and their interests. There are also support groups. So joining a support group of other people who have FASD, this can provide a sense of community and also a safe space to connect with people who have a shared experience with you. Next would be housing assistance. So we know that people with FASD they may need assistance with housing, such as a supported living arrangement to help them better manage their condition. For those of you who are living with FASD, it can be difficult to know where to turn for help. And that's why it's important to seek out support from your local organizations and also from national groups that specialize in FASD. So remember, you're not alone. There are many, many adults who are out there facing the same thing, facing the same challenges. And with the resources, you can live a happy, fruitful, and successful life. Okay, so that concludes this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And even more importantly, I hope you got something out of it. I hope you can take this video and maybe help somebody. If one person is helped from this video, my job is done and I'm happy. So until next time, be safe.